welcome back to part three of Password Cracking 101 plus one. Okay, where did we leave part two? Well, we conducted our first dictionary attack. Okay, we took a Linux hash that we looked at uh, in, the, in, the, in the earlier video, identified the hash mode required to attack this, and then attacked it using the dictionary supplied on your Kali virtual machines that we've supplied you. If you've just joined us, you can download this Kali virtual machine from our site. There will be a link you can get it and it's pre-populated with everything required, all the questions, answers, and other resources we're going to be looking at throughout this training. So let's move on from our dictionary attack and see how we can extend this using rules. So rules are things we can use to augment our word lists, our dictionaries, and they give us a really, really good chance of, well, an increased chance of attacking hashes because rules help us do things um, that we as sort of society have been kind of told and conditioned into believing make our password stronger. Things like character to number substitutions, classics here, substituting an E for a three or an O for a zero or adding a one at the end of our password or a one, two, three exclamation mark. Statistically speaking, you know, when we're all kind of told to uh, choose a number, add, add a number and a special character, we love to use one. One, two, three is, of course, very popular. And one of the most commonly used symbols is the exclamation mark. Not only because we as society love to exclaim our passwords, but because it's on the same key on our keyboards as the one is. And we're quite lazy, us humans, so we don't like to move our hands around terribly much. It's very common. And passwords like cybersecurity is a, is a, is a, is a people problem, not a technical one. And, us, and as we as society is very, are very predictable you know attackers know this too and they can guess the way that we choose our passwords so let's take a word list with insecurity in it apply some rules that will tell it every time you see an e change it to a three add a one at the end add a one two three at the end add an exclamation mark whatever it might be and then our word list can then be as you'll imagine extrapolated out and we'll have many 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 more guesses than just the number of words in our word list there are um many rules available to us uh, many come shipped with hashcat by default there are also many third-party ones you can download as well um, there aren't there isn't a sort of single rule that you should necessarily use rules are suited to different attacks based on how that rule has been designed the number of rules there and the complexity of the algorithm you're attacking will also largely dictate what rules you should choose if any because fast hashes are better suited to some rules and very very slow hashes are better suited to others. So, as I said, Hashcat has several default rule sets. How do we apply a rule? Well, we'll take a Hashcat command like the one we've done previously. I'm not going to put the full command on here. Needless to say, after our word list, you can add dash dash rules or dash r, followed by the rule of your choice. Now, by default, the Hashcat has by default Hashcat has a folder called rules, which lives in the Hashcat folder. If I jump in here quickly. We can see we have our folder here, and inside there, there are a number of default rules. There are also some non-default ones in here as well, and we'll touch on those soon. But many of these rules come with Hashcat, and like I said, we can use them to uh, augment our attacks. Okay, so one non-default rule that you'll see in there is actually one that I created a few years ago um, when I was working at my uh, former organisation called One Rule to Rule Them All. Um, this is a huge rule set. It has had some tweaks uh, over time since its release and there is actually a kind of like a version 2 in the pipeline that's on the to-do list so at some point I might get around to, uh, to releasing that. Um, this rule was created by testing a number of default and non-default rules as shown on the right there across a very very large data set well not 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 super large but large enough to get a good idea um, of, of rule performance this was a, a test data set of a little over four million unsalted hashes that was that came out from a data breach uh, the blog post from my former employer is there so worth a read if you're interested uh, but because these were unsalted md5s they made a fantastic test bed to test the performance and um, the success rates of a number of these rules now currently there's a little over 51 I think thousand hashes in it um, so this shouldn't be used on something like bcrypt for example which is a really really slow hash it would it would be painful it would never end but for things like MD45, NTLM, SHA-1 uh, fast hashes it has been shown to be sort of quite successful so uh, if you're interested it is there and it is on the Kali builds as well that you've downloaded 
So how are rules created? I'm not going to dig through an actual rule file now to have a look, but if you look inside some of those rules, for example, best64.rule, um, one of the sort of the easiest to kind of understand, you'll see that the rules are generated um, as shown here. Now there'll be probably several references to the, uh, the Hashcat wiki throughout this training because it is very, very useful. And of course, being a wiki, it answers a lot of the questions that people have. So highly recommend you go looking through there first. Um, but let's just have a look at a couple of examples. A rule can contain a number of functions and the function will dictate how that rule augments your dictionary. So if you see a colon in a rule set, it does nothing. Let the vanilla candidate go through. So if your input word in your dictionary is password, it will just test password as is, no problems, okay? If you have a lowercase l on one line, that will lowercase all the letters. As you can see here, this will take your input candidate of this and then a test as shown here. It will make everything lowercase. You can see how these will build up. Common ones you also might see dollar $x. Dollar $x would mean append of the character x to the end. As you might guess, testing things like dollar one for dollar one, dollar one, dollar two, dollar three would add one, two, three at the end, and so on and so forth. And you can imagine how taking a rule file with a number of these rules, and I highly encourage you to of course test and create your own rules as well, how quickly that can go through a word list of a million, you know, and then quickly make that 10 million or 100 million guesses, depending on how many rules you have. So these are how the rules are generated, okay? Here's a screenshot of just that very high level example if we've got a word list with just the word password I've, I've just created a custom rule here uh, just to show, show you how this might generate candidates we've got don't do anything we've got t0 which is toggle case zero now sorry toggle position zero and position zero is the first character so we always start counting from zero so that will make it an upper if it's a lower it'll make it an upper if it's an upper it'll make it a lower and then add one add one two add one two three we can see here that when we take our word list, mangle it with our rule, and then show this to standard out, we can see what it's done here. Leave intact, so do nothing to our original password. Toggle the case of zero has made that a lowercase p, and then add one, one, two, one, two, three at the end. Hopefully that's quite you know simple to understand, but as these rule files grow, as you can imagine, we get really crazy, weird, and wonderful candidates. And there are really good rule sets out there that will allow you to do just this. So the next hash we're going to look at, NTLM. So NTLM is our kind of de facto Windows logon hash. Now, even though we do use NTLMs in, in modern day computing, it has been around a really, really long time. It goes back as far as NT, in fact, NTLM does. So uh, they have been around. Uh, NTLM does have some issues, uh, many of which Kerberos addresses, but we do still use NTLM hashes in, in environments. We see them all the time. So it's one of the common things you see uh, for any testers looking at taking this course, you know, sitting this course at the moment. Anyone who's, you know, dumped active directory will have un undoubtedly had lots and lots of NTLM hashes of users within an organization. Now, luckily for us, NTLM is a really, really fast hash. There's very little that's quicker than NTLM, actually, because it is based on MD4, as shown at the bottom. It's an MD4 of the UTF-16 little MD and encoded password. Now, UTF-16 LE, we're not going to dig into encoding too much, but Windows is kind of, a lot of Windows is UTF-16 uh, based. And, and if we just encode our password and MD4 it, that's how an NTLM is generated, okay? So they're really, really weak in terms of they're, they're, quick to, they're quick to crunch the numbers, it's quick to compute, it's unsalted, which is great, um, and NTLM hashes are used from Vista in 2008 onwards uh, by default. Before them, we had um, LM hashes. We do have a token sort of slide on that, uh, but NTLM is kind of, of where, we're, where we're at now. NTLMs are constructed a little bit differently to the Linux hash we saw in the last video. We do have our username, and then we have a number of colon delimited fields. First of all, we have our RID, our relative identifier, which we're not going to dig into, but it's how Windows identifies you. So users start typically from 1,000, 1,001, 1,002, local users on a machine, for example. And then we have two hashes separated by a colon in the middle here. We have our LM hash, um, which we'll touch on in a second, um, and then we have our NTLM hash. Now, this hash here is the hash that we are we are generally in, in modern kind of modern uh, window systems. This is the NTLM hash that we would be attacking. NT uh, LM incredibly weak, as we'll find out in a second. And this actual value, this static value, is a null hash. It's actually a value that's repeated twice. You can see here it starts AAD3 and then repeats itself AAD3. This is a null hash, which you which you would see 
because it needs to, you know, um, sort of length requirements need a value to be to be stored here. But this is a null hash, so it would it doesn't store a hash value here. Okay, this is why LM is so uh, utterly terrible. If we take the clear text password here of password one exclamation mark as shown. The first thing that LM hashing did, now bear in mind LM was used by default up until Windows XP and 2003. Since Vista in 2008 it's been disabled by default, but you, you could. Uh, you could, if you really wanted to, re-enable it. There is no real good reason to do that, but you could if you wanted to. It uppercased your password, okay? So you've immediately lost all 26 lower alpha characters. We don't need to test for them, which is fantastic. So it's reducing what's called the key space, which we'll look at in a future video. So everything's uppercased. The next thing it do is it would either pad or truncate your password to be 14 characters in length, okay? So if you had a uh, eight character password, the remaining characters up until 14 would be used, but they'd be null bytes effectively. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be empty, as kind of denoted here by the, these asterisks. Those aren't clear text asterisks. They are just shown to be sort of padding in this instance. Similarly, if you had a 20 character password and you're using a Windows XP machine, the last six would be completely ignored, just so dropped off. So you would have a 14 character password. So whether you like it or not, you have a 14 character password. In this instance, we can see this is split up. So the next thing that happens in LM hashing is that your 14 character password is split into two seven character passwords. As you can see here, we have our password password here, and then D1 exclamation mark and four null bytes. Okay, so this would just be padded. Now already, if we're looking at attacking seven character passwords, this makes the number of guesses required very computationally feasible based on the speeds we can attack. So this, we're already in very 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 dangerous territory here. These two seven character passwords are then null padded by a byte to make them eight bytes in length. The reason being is that's the requirement for a DES key. So DES encryption is a six, you need a 60, it has a 64 bit key. Only 56 bytes, 56, uh, sorry, 56 bits of those are used for the actual encryption, but we need 64 to conform to the DES length requirement. So we have eight bytes and then they are DES encrypted with a fixed string here which has been published since the beginning of time <laughs> as it's published by microsoft it's sort of trivial to compute that and the resulting two values are just concatenated together to make our lm hash now whilst this sounds like a lot's going on uh, it is actually very very simple for a computer to do the number crunching on this and this is the kind of era where rainbow tables were really good because you could generate rainbow tables for lm hashing and they could fall very very quickly nowadays computing power means we can brute force the key space of lm very very quickly as well so either way you look at it this is incredibly weak it should never ever be seen we want them to include it just to sort of show how it was constructed. So on to the next part, dictionary with rule attacks. We're going to jump back into our uh, Kali operating system. Of course, um, if you don't want to see the answers, you should probably pause now and have a go at cracking it yourself. But we are going to look at attacking X3 NTLM hash. So if I bring Kali back up into view, let's take Kali, uh, sorry, let's take Cashcat and first of all grep for NTLM. And we're going to get more than one hit because there's more than one type of hash which involves NTLM, but a raw NTLM hash is shown here down the bottom, mode 1000. So that's the mode we're going to need. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to look to attack our hash without a rule just to see if this works. So, um, I've saved cutting out exercise three. Believe me, this is the hash inside. Just to see if this works, we're going to do mode 1000 for NTLM, take the hash and use our top 100 against it. We can see here this did not crack the hash. We've recovered zero of one and the status is shown as exhausted. Okay. Now the reason I've done this first is just to show you that the password does not exist in our top 100 TXT uh, in that form. We're going to need to augment this with a rule. In this case, we're going to use one rule to rule them all, which is located in the rules folder of your Kali VMs. And by adding this, we can see that the password cracks. OK, we can see that we've got a number of um, a, a much bigger key space to attack now, sorry, because we've now augmented this with rules. But because this is a very, uh, you know, um, 
deliberately designed exercise to be very quick. We know that the password is going to be identified very quickly. And we can see here it is Bigfoot Sunshine after the hash. OK, so we have the hash, a colon and then the clear text Bigfoot Sunshine. It cracked instantly. Status changes to cracked. All good. OK, so that was cracking an NTLM hash using a rule based attack. So taking our dictionary and augmenting that with a rule. Join us for the next video and we're going to start looking at different attack types. Thanks very much and uh, hope to see you all again soon.